Well, good afternoon. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, good evening over in Europe and good morning, very early morning over in Asia. Uh, it's the MSP Tech Talk series and away we go. We continue the journey. Always a crowd pleaser. We're going to talk about compliance and some other topics. Let's uh, We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, it's always a little bit of housekeeping. So one of the things you want to do is use the questions feature that I'll be monitoring and in interrupting these guys uh, with questions along the way today. And we usually, uh, with Mike and Joel, we have a lot of questions. So don't, don't hold back. Um, next week, I'll be down in Fort Lauderdale on uh, Thursday, Friday at the uh, IT Expo event. I'm giving a speech on Thursday on blockchain. And on Friday, I'm giving a speech on uh, data backup. Now, the blockchain lecture, just FYI, it was just moved today from 9 a.m. Eastern to 3 p.m. Eastern. If you find yourself at IT Expo down in Fort Lauderdale, hoping to bring together a beer summit on Thursday night, reach out to me if, if you think you'll be at that show. And then uh, two weeks later, uh, as we start to turn the corner on mid-February, uh, I'll be at IBM think in San Francisco for the week and I'll just leave it at that a couple other things starting to line up like uh, South by Southwest and Austin and a couple other things but I'll, I'll, I'll leave those hanging out there for today uh, with that said we should get going so let's do some basic introduction Joel I'll start with you sir you were on our platform um, I believe late last year and yes. you're back please introduce yourself for people that, that, that don't know Joel Oh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joel Maloff. I am the Senior Vice President of Strategic Alliances and Chief Compliance Officer for Phone.com. Uh, Phone.com is a hosted PBX uh, cloud-based voice and video service provider. Um, we became HIPAA compliant uh, almost two years ago, uh, and that is my responsibility. It has been uh, very successful for us um, Mike and I have been talking, and when he's done with his discussion, we'll come back, and I will relate that as to how it pertains to phone.com and our customers and what we've been doing. Okie dokie. And then, Mike, hang on one second. I, I wanted to make mention my contribution to the compliance conversation today is I'm wearing a Windows XP golf shirt. It's the least I could do because um, I know we're going to kind of weave into how that operating systems and compliance and end of life and that kind of thing. I know we'll probably get to that a little bit later. And then Mike, you asked the right question during, uh, as we were teeing up today, why do I have a blue screen uh, behind me? Um, because I do the CNM box and uh, for another network called Northwest Digital News, look them up. And I have Tech Tuesday with Northwest Digital News out of the Portland, Oregon area. And we went blue screen this week to insert a background of uh, a globe, the space, it must be Eclipse Week too, something like that. Mike, you got the talking stick, introduce yourself, let's rock. <laughs> Thanks, Harry, and uh, be before I start, I'll tell you that blue screen, I've been in this industry so long that I, I don't like seeing blue screens, uh, but also I'm not sure I'd be wearing a shirt that would indicate end of life, so <laughs> let, let, let's move on. <laughs> Go on. So, I'll, I'll introduce myself here in, in just a second, but the uh, what I want to talk to everybody about today, and first of all, thanks for taking time out for this. This is a really important topic for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's some risk involved, but also there are huge rewards if you're a managed service provider. And when we're going to talk about HIPAA today, uh, it's a U.S. regulation that protects uh, health information, but it all the messages can apply to just about any type of regulation anywhere in the world. So when we're talking about uh, legislation and you know how laws are written and then the rules are enforced and things like that, you could be in Europe and you could apply this to GDPR. You could be in California and apply it to the California state data breach laws. So there's some uh, messages today that even though we're going to be using HIPAA as an example, these things will uh, transcend into other types of uh, regulatory frameworks. So today I'm talking about hidden HIPAA, and the reason I, I call it hidden HIPAA is there are a lot of things in HIPAA that you can just look for all day and you won't find. And what I'm going to do today is show you some resources that you can use to get more managed service sales and security projects. 
by actually going back to the sources of the information and being able to convince people that these threats are real, people have paid uh, real fines, there's been a lot of embarrassment, and uh, some businesses have lost a lot of money and, in fact, closed after data breaches. So who am I and why should you listen to me? Well, for those of you that don't know me, I've been around this industry for over 35 years. And I've owned my own VAR business. I've owned my own MSP business. We had all the different labels through all the different iterations of this industry since about 1980. When I became an Apple dealer, uh, we had an electronics business, and our, uh, our family business was an electronics store. We decided to bring computers in, and we decided that Apple was the way to go. So I started going to meetings with Steve Jobs and, and was there at the beginning, uh, actually about a year or two into uh, Apple's existence and then uh, all the way through all the different iterations of the Macintosh and so forth. So I know the business because I've been in the business. And I've been in the security business for as long as I've been in the computer business. And the reason for that is that my definition of security is simple. It's the protection of data against loss, theft, or unauthorized access. So way back 30 years ago, we were doing security because we were backing up people's data to protect it against loss. We didn't have all the threats that we have today. We didn't have all the security tools that we have today. But we were in the security business ever since we started. In 2003, I went to an Ingram conference. And I learned about HIPAA. And I thought it was a huge opportunity for me and for our company because the federal government was going to regulate the IT industry cybersecurity. So I went and got a certification, came back, and started marketing our company as healthcare IT experts. I'd already had some background in healthcare. I was an emergency medical technician. I worked part time while I owned the computer business in an emergency room, basically just to get experience. I was the rescue captain in our local fire department, and for 19 years I traveled on the IndyCar safety team. So we started marketing ourselves as uh, healthcare compliance experts, and I was offered the job as the chief information officer for a, for a local hospital, and I turned it down. I wasn't ready to close my business to go to work for them, but I did convince them after about the third time they came back to hire my company as their IT department. So I became the CIO of a hospital. It was the best education I could get, totally different than being a vendor. Uh, being on the inside it was a great education, and uh, what I'm going to do today, today is to share some things that I've learned over the years that I probably would not have learned just as an MSP. Uh, moved out to Las Vegas to help a friend switch from break fix to managed services. We did the business turnaround. I was ready to leave, and he gave me part ownership of the company. Through that relationship, I became a school district chief information officer, outsourced, and I did that for six years. So I've worked in the private sector, the public sector, healthcare, which is regulated by HIPAA, and school district uh, K-12 education, which is regulated by FERPA. And there were some other regulations that we had to follow as well. Uh, our managed service business developed one of the first online cloud backup solutions, actually cloud backup and recovery solutions, and I was chief operating officer for that. I'm involved with the FBI's InfraGuard program, very involved with CompTIA, and I've got a whole bunch of certifications in security and compliance. You may have seen me speak at different events. I've spoken at a lot of CompTIA events. Yep. I've written articles for healthcare organizations and for uh, printed publications and online publications, and I was invited to speak to the medical team at the Kennedy Space Center. In 2017, I published How to Avoid HIPAA Headaches, and this has become a bestseller on Amazon. And the concept of the book is not to explain all the details about HIPAA. There's certainly enough of those around. This is to take uh, penalties and data breaches and compliance violations that have occurred and deconstruct them to what the root causes were and create lessons learned that you can share. You can learn yourself, first of all, to protect your own business, but you can also share with clients. And uh, I found out that a bunch of MSPs have been buying this book. I make like 35 cents a copy. Don't ever think you're going to be an author and get rich. No. But, <laughs> MSPs are buying the book and sending it to their clients along with proposals. I was invited to work with Rapid Fire Tools, which we were using, but I was invited to work with them 
to develop their HIPAA compliance module. They have their generic modules for network and security assessments, and they come out with messages like your passwords are set to never expire and that's not best practices. What we did with Rapid Fire was to take the same scanning uh, mechanisms and coming out with the same results, but instead of saying it's not best practices, it would say, for example, this is a violation of HIPAA section and then fill in the, the section number. So the HIPAA compliance module is focused on HIPAA. It is, uh, uses HIPAA language and it has some uh, different components from Rapid Fire's network and security module built into it. So it's different than those and it's, it's just for healthcare. So if you're doing healthcare assessments, it can save you a lot of time because you don't have to take the generic assessment and kind of rewrite it for, for healthcare, which is what I was doing before they asked me to help develop the tool. Rapid Fire's got a new product called Audit Guru. And what Audit Guru is, is a platform. And the platform takes, it, it does the scanning and it has a, an on-site appliance that goes to the client site. So it monitors their network and it sends reports back, but it also is a repository for the end users to put their policies and procedures and things like evidence of training up in it as well. So there are a lot of products out there and a lot of companies that offer these HIPAA made easy products where you can upload policies and procedures, but they don't do the technology scanning and the assessments that Rapid Fire does. So Rapid Fire has taken the concept and combined the two into Audit Guru, it's something they've just announced, definitely worth looking at. CompTIA offers this Security Trust Mark Plus. Now many of you are familiar with CompTIA and you're probably familiar with um, A Plus and Security Plus and Network Plus and all the individual certifications for people. The Trust Mark is for a business and it's a business class accreditation. That means that your company is assessed for your policies and your procedures and your implementation of security controls. It's not dependent on an individual person. So that means that as an entity, you have to deploy security within your own business. And one of the things I've learned over the years is that many times managed service providers are like the cobbler's children that have no shoes. You're telling your clients to secure their environments. You're offering all these security tools. You're monitoring their systems to make sure that the antivirus is properly installed and patches are up to date and all the things that you include in your managed services. But because you're so busy with clients, you often forget to pay attention to yourself. And everybody's so busy that sometimes your own internal security slips. So one of the things about the trust mark is that it actually helps you protect your data. And when you're an MSP, uh, I think you may have seen headlines recently that the Chinese hackers have attacked MSPs and are specifically targeting MSPs because if I wanted to go after a hundred of your clients and hack their networks, I would have to go to a hundred different places and get their get domain admin credentials and logins and passwords and things. But I don't have to do that. I can just go to you and hack you because somewhere in your systems, and it doesn't matter which PSA tool or, or whatever you're using or password manager, if I can hack into that, I just gained access to all of your client sites, including domain admin level. So this is why you as an MSP need to secure your own environment. But the other part of the trust mark is that it's based on the NIST cybersecurity framework. So not only will you implement it, you'll learn it and you'll be able to take that to clients. More and more, we're seeing things like state regulations and other types of industry regulations using the NIST cybersecurity framework as the basis for those regulations. So the trust mark is really a great opportunity for you to, number one, learn the information, number two, secure your uh, own network, and number three, have a solution that you can take to clients that's a security framework that's recognized with the government and that gives them uh, some good protection, first of all, against the loss of data, but even if they did have a breach, they've got a strong argument to use, for example, in a lawsuit, that they follow the government standards and they did what they should have to protect that they weren't negligent. I've earned the trust mark for three of my own companies and I've coached over 30 other companies to earn it. So now let's talk about HIPAA. 
And for those of you that aren't familiar with HIPAA, even those that are, let's do a review. HIPAA is a federal law to protect health information. So we talk about protected health information, PHI. You'll sometimes see EPHI, that's just electronic protected health information data. And protected health information can be verbal, written, or electronic. So when HIPAA came out in 2003, it was the first time that doctors were told you can't talk uh, about a patient in front of another person who shouldn't be authorized to hear it. So that's the verbal part. Written records were used for many years. Now many of them have shifted to electronic. But any piece of paper that has a patient's name on it and anything to do with their treatment or diagnosis or payment for health care is protected under HIPAA. And the same thing in electronic format. When we talk about electronic format, it's a wide range. It can be, for example, words typed into an electronic health care database. So we've got uh, the written word, and those words could also be typed into a document or in a document that's a PDF file or an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document that's just sitting on someone's network. And one of the misconceptions, one of the big myths I hear all the time is, well, we don't have any patient information on our local network. It's all in the cloud up in our electronic health record system. That has never once been true. When we've assessed clients and looked at what's on their network, we have found that even if they are using a cloud-based electronic health system or electronic health record system, that they're, they're in the healthcare business. They have Word documents. They have Excel spreadsheets. They have PDF files and emails and email attachments that have information about patients on it. Same way you would have information about your clients in your, in your uh, documents out on your network. So when we look at HIPAA, sometimes people are surprised as to who enforces it. So data breaches are officially enforced at the federal level by the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, and we call that the OCR. But the High Tech Act back in 20, uh, 2009 gave state attorneys general the authority to enforce HIPAA. So an attorney, a state level attorney general. So they essentially multiplied the HIPAA enforcement by 50 by inviting all the states to also enforce HIPAA. The Federal Trade Commission doesn't look at patients as medical patients. They look at patients as consumers. So when there's a data breach, even if it's a breach of medical information, the Federal Trade Commission has weighed in and fined organizations and, and the worst penalty, even worse than having to write a check and pay a fine, is when the FTC puts you on a 20-year monitored compliance program. And they recently had a situation with a business that was in New Jersey, a transcription company, and I believe the owner was based in Florida. And the settlement that they got, so this is like a plea bargain, uh, so it was a criminal case. So the Federal Trade Commission worked out this. First of all, the company shut down. Second of all, the owner, was banned from doing business in New Jersey for life. And he has to report to any business that he either owns or goes to work for that he's under sanctions by the Federal Trade Commission. So they didn't put him in prison, but they put him in business prison just by because he violated HIPAA and caused uh, these compliance violations and data breaches. So he's banned for life from New Jersey. Hey, Mike. Um, yeah, Harry. Yeah, I've, I've got an analogy for, for the rest of us to translate that, although your example is pretty clear. But uh, quickly, uh, uh, a funny story off of Bainbridge Island in the great green Pacific Northwest. A guy told me that they had illegally cut um, and trimmed some trees on a slope. And the penalty was along the same lines that they couldn't sell, they couldn't do anything for 20 or 25 years with the property. Um, so it was a, a homeowner jail, <laughs> but the, yeah. the, the same idea, but go on. Well, the, the reason I'm bringing some of this up, and that, that's a great story, Harry, is that people say, oh, what are the odds of the federal government getting? Well, here's the last way that HIPAA is enforced, lawsuits. And there have been lawsuits in HIPAA. Now, if you read the HIPAA law, and I'm gonna talk about why reading the law doesn't always give you the best information. But when you read the law, it says that there's no private right of action under HIPAA. That means that if there's a HIPAA penalty, the federal law says you can't sue somebody for it. But states can give you the rights to do that. So there was recently, in, in December, a lawsuit ended between a patient and her doctor from a HIPAA violation. 
And it was about, it started out when her daughter was born and there was a lawsuit for visitation by her boyfriend or her ex-boyfriend. She sued her doctor because they released the medical records to the boyfriend without authorization. It took 12 years going through the courts and then she was awarded $853,000. So the real message here is that you don't need to have the federal government come down on you for a HIPAA violation. The patient can sue and in this case, I have no idea. I can't imagine what 12 years worth of legal fees were. But just imagine what it cost this medical practice, plus the fact they lost, plus the fact it's all public, plus the fact that they were an OBGYN clinic. And OBGYN is a competitive market for healthcare. In other words, when you're going to have a baby, there's a lot of advertising that you should come to our clinic and use our doctors. Uh, to have your child. It's competitive in the marketplace, and this clinic was in the headlines for 12 years because of a data breach. So why is HIPAA so important? Well, first of all, you have to look at who's affected by it. According to the federal government, there are over 700,000 HIPAA-covered entities. Covered entities mean that they're health care providers and health plans that have to comply with HIPAA. So a health plan would be an insurance company it could be Medicare at the federal level, Medicaid at the state level. It could be a private insurance company like Blue Cross or United Healthcare, or it could even be a business, an individual company that self-funds its health insurance. So we have a bank that's a client. Why would a bank be a HIPAA client? Because they don't pay a health insurer a premium to protect or to, to take the risk of healthcare costs away from them they reimburse their employees for uh, medical expenses. So they're under they're a HIPAA covered entity. But then every covered entity under HIPAA works with other businesses. They could work with a business like uh, Joel's, phone.com. They could work with a shredding company. They could work with us as HIPAA consultants. They could work with you as a managed service provider. And that means that we're called business associates. And business associates have to comply with HIPAA. We, since 2013, when the omnibus rule came out, we have to do more than we used to to comply with HIPAA because we have to have full compliance programs. If we use a subcontractor, so for example, if you're an MSP and you're going to resell Joel's service, uh, phone.com, or you're going to resell an online backup solution in relation to the covered entity that vendor is a subcontractor. They're contracting with you, the covered entity's contracting with you, and then you're bringing in this other company, a subcontractor. So there's no real way to know the number, but just assume that if every one of the 700,000 healthcare providers had two or three business associates, and some of them are huge health systems that have hundreds or thousands, you're looking at two to three million businesses here in the United States that have to comply. Add those two numbers together and you're up to like 4 million businesses, including the healthcare providers and health plans that have to comply. Patient rights are recognized as civil rights. Your right to your medical record is a civil right. Your right to have your information protected from unauthorized disclosure is a civil right. So the federal government takes this very seriously, so do the state attorneys general that when there's a breach, it's not just, oh, too bad, so sad, we, you know, we lost some information. It's that, no, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, or in the case of Equifax, 140 million people, or in the case of Marriott, what is it, 500 million, Harry? Like yes, uh, yeah, of the planet Earth. <laughs> right. And hey, 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 Mike, a quick, quick question, yeah. if, since I interrupted you, if you don't mind, on the patient's rights, the civil rights, and I'm just curious, um, does that include spousal or domestic partner rights? So can your spouse get access to your medical records? And then I'm going to throw you another loop. Um, can that become part? Well, first of all, can, can that happen? Let's start with that. Well, no, not necessarily. So yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, there's a difference. First of all, there's there's a difference between like a parent and a minor child. But what, what you just asked is, can your spouse get your medical records? Absolutely Correct. not, unless you authorize it. Now, first yeah. of all, you can give your medical records to anybody, and you can put them on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. But your doctor yeah. can't. Okay. So you've answered my you question. Go, okay. Yeah. If you go to the doctor and say to the doctor, 
um, and, and you don't have to even say this because the default is that no one gets your information unless you authorize it. But you could say, I don't want my wife, child, parent, whatever, right. to know right. what this diagnosis is. Yeah, okay. Now, you can authorize it, and you can put it in your record that your family member is authorized. And um, I did that. My mom was ill, and she, the, the reason, so I would take her to the doctor if I was visiting at home and things. So they knew because I was with her, and they could ask her that day, is it okay to talk in front of Mike? And she would always say yes, but I made him sign the HIPAA authorization form because I wanted to be able to call in, or if there was a bill that I had a question about, I wanted right. to be able to talk to exactly him in the records. So l l let's keep going. Hackers yeah, yeah, yeah. You answered my question. Thank you. Thank oh, you. That's my. I'm just doing this because we're, we're pushed for time, and then we want to open this up for questions. So hackers target medical records, okay, in a big way, because. When you look at things like credit card numbers, if a credit card number is breached, the credit card company cancels the number, sends you a new card, and that old number can't be used. A medical record has your name, your birth date, your social security number, medical information, family information, lots of things that can be used to either steal your identity or create uh, or, or do fraudulent things, you know, create fraudulent medical bills. Or in some cases, people have even gotten drugs using patients' uh, identities. So hackers love medical records because they have a really long shelf life. I tell people to think of a credit card number as milk, which has a short shelf life, and a medical record as wine, which can actually get better with age. There are huge financial risks, fines, lawsuits, and even investments. We're working with companies that have their investors working with us to make sure that they are compliant. So I started out to say we're going to talk about hidden HIPAA. Why is HIPAA so confusing? And it's because of the way that the government works. And in this case, I know we're doing this during a government shutdown, so the government's not working that much. But let's go through how policy is made and how these rules come into effect and why it's so difficult to understand what they mean and to find information. So acts are passed by Congress. HIPAA. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. 2009, it was modified by a law called the High Tech Act. So when you hear the word act, that's an act passed by Congress and then signed into law by the president. And then the responsibility for enforcing the law is given to an agency within the government. So HIPAA went to the Department of Health and Human Services. The agency creates a basic rule and puts out a thing called an NPRM, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and they say, okay, the law was passed and here's what the rules are going to be. So the law itself isn't the rule. The rules are written by the agency that's going to enforce it. And then they put this draft policy out or draft rule out for comment. Then you get into the interesting part because people start commenting on this and then there's a lot of lobbying. So, for example, when HIPAA came out in 2000, or actually it was written around 2000, there were questions about the level of security, and organizations like the American Medical Association came back to the federal government and say, hey, you know, this makes sense for a big organization, a big healthcare organization, but it doesn't make sense for the doctor, you know, working out of his house on a street corner. So there were some things that were diluted in the original HIPAA law before it became uh, the official rule. So once the comment period's over, lobbying's over, the agency issues the final rule. That's where we really start to know what they mean. So it will tell us, for example, the HIPAA security rule has a list of about 50 things we have to do to protect data. Then when the rule is issued, there's a, a moratorium. There's a time period for organizations to comply before enforcement. So when the omnibus rule came out in 2013, it came out in January, people actually had till September to get into compliance. So they didn't enforce it for nine months. Now, we're in 2019, which is six years later. There's still some people that haven't gotten around to complying, but the government did give people time to get their act together before they started enforcing it. Now, at this point, we know what the rule means, or we think we do. We know what the rule says, but we're really not sure exactly what it means. So over time, the federal government will start publishing uh, frequently asked questions and guidance documents. And they'll go on 
uh, a campaign. They'll, go, they'll hit the road and they'll do webinars, they'll do outreach and speaking at events and things like that. So you'll see my picture here with Roger Severino. Roger was talking at an event last year, uh, the HIMSS conference, and this is one of the ways that they get out and kind of press the flesh and answer people's questions. And they're not just some hidden entity buried in the federal government. The agency then conducts audits and enforcements. And this is where we really start to find out what those rules mean because we can see what the items are that they're auditing. They have to publish the audit controls. It's all public information, and so are the enforcements. So when the rule says you have to protect data, and it's pretty uh, vague and it's pretty bland, and then they start uh, penalizing organizations for losing encrypt or unencrypted laptops and having data breaches and having unauthorized people gain access to their data, that's when we really find out what the, what this means for security. So to understand HIPAA, you have to understand the laws, which in this case are HIPAA and high tech, the rules and the modification. So we have a privacy rule, a security rule, a breach notification rule, and the omnibus final rule, which actually went back and changed the original privacy and security rules, plus the frequently asked questions, plus the guidance and the enforcement actions. And those are the attention getters, the enforcement actions. When somebody says, oh, I don't have to worry about my laptops being encrypted, and then they get a million dollar penalty or a two million dollar penalty, they wish they hadn't said that. So Mike? This, yep. Yeah, uh, this is probably the best place to, to just make a quick comment and a quick reply from you. Totally appreciate time management. When I reached out to you and Joel and said, let's do compliance, let's do HIPAA, I said, Mike, it's been about a year. We, we, we had you on, I believe it was last winter. What do you know? A year has gone by. And I said, you know, I want to do a, a webinar on how the laws have changed in that last year, right? Let's always a good idea to level set in the compliance area and so on. And you corrected me. You corrected, and this slide speaks to that. It, 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 essentially, my recollection is it was more how the rules, modifications, guidance changed, Harry. It's not how the law has changed. Do, do, do you want to echo that real quick, and then we'll get back on track? Sure. So, well, first of all, we're specifically talking about HIPAA, and HIPAA hasn't changed. Uh, the law hasn't changed since the, the omnibus rule came out in 2013, which has been six years. And it hadn't changed before that for, uh, since 2005 when the security rule kicked in. So that was eight years. So the laws themselves don't change very often, but the guidance does, and the enforcement actions are coming out all the time, and that's uh, teaching us. Now, what is not on today's topic, and Harry, I suggest we do a, a different discussion someday about state data breach laws, because state data breach laws are changing a lot. And of course, we have 50 states. Now, all 50 states have data breach laws. And uh, New York has uh, a new law that's going through the legislature. North Carolina just proposed a law. It's not law yet. That will take a ransomware attack and require you to notify everybody whose data is locked up. Even if it hasn't been stolen, a ransomware attack will require notification if the North Carolina law passes as written. And of course, as I said before, there's lobbying and, and there's arguing with the legislatures. But state laws change pretty often. Federal law doesn't change very often at all. Okay, cool. Yeah, I made a note for spring, uh, summer quarter. Uh, please continue. Thanks. You're welcome. So, you know, when we talk about HIPAA and we look at the federal laws, and one of the things, and, and I'm not making any political statement here, but the president during his campaign said that uh, one of his goals was to relax regulations and not penalize businesses for, uh, you know, not create a burden for regulatory compliance. Well, when you look at the math, you'll see that uh, that hasn't exactly come true. In 2014 and 2015, the combined years, total HIPAA penalties at the federal level were $14 million. They tripled in 2016 and 2017 to $42 million. But 2018, that just ended, 25, it's actually like 0.683. So I rounded it out to $25.7 million in one year in HIPAA penalties. So this is still a real threat, and people are paying real money when they're doing the wrong thing. So I'm going to run through. I'm not going to go through every word on every slide in the interest of time because you're going to get this presentation and go back, be able to go back and review it. But I just want to show you what I've done here. So the question, 
Why must you have a domain? These are questions I hear from MSPs all the time, where HIPAA doesn't say you have to have a domain, which is true. But what does HIPAA tell you that you have to do that means you really have to have a domain? So HIPAA has a requirement for audit controls, logging of activity. So when you see that little F curly Q, that means that that's a section of the Code of Federal Regulations. It's section 164.312, paragraph B. And when you go back over this presentation, if you want to search on that, you'll read all the details that the federal government tells you that you have to do for audit logging. Now, it doesn't give you a whole lot of detail. It says you have to audit activity at the level that's appropriate for your organization. But we know from experience and from penalties and also criminal investigations that when the FBI shows up at your door, if you contact law enforcement to say you've been hacked, they want to see an audit log that shows who opened the file, who logged in, who opened the file, do they make any changes, did they copy it and send it off the premises. So audit controls require you to document activity on your network. In healthcare, the electronic health record systems have it built in. Windows, for example, you need to turn it on. And then because it's HIPAA, you have to save the logs for six years. Why else do you have to have a domain? You have to have access control. So you have to have controls across your network. Now, if it's a one or two person uh, medical office, it's really expensive to have a domain, but you still have to be able to do things like the audit controls, password management, unique user identification, information system activity reviews, which means that the healthcare provider has to look at logs to see if they can determine unauthorized activity. Is an employee looking at a patient record they shouldn't? Why would that matter? Because HIPAA has a section of the privacy law, the privacy rule, that says that there, that you have to have minimum necessary access. That means that if you're working in a healthcare organization and you have access to a million patient records, you're only allowed to look at the patient records for the people that relate to you through business functions. So if you're a biller, only the people you're billing. If you're a nurse, only the people you're treating. You can't go searching through the database for your family members, your neighbors, the mayor, the uh, goalie on the local hockey team, professional hockey team, or any of that stuff. So the other thing that I've put on these slides is what penalties there were. So if you look up Leahy Hospital in HIPAA, you will find that they paid an $850,000 fine for not doing activity reviews. So I'm going to run through the rest of these quickly. Does HIPAA require managed services? Well, no, it doesn't specifically. But when you look at 164.312.C1 of HIPAA, and this is going to be repeated on several slides, it says you must implement policies and procedures to protect electronic protected health information from improper alteration or destruction and also unauthorized access. So when you look at what is under that in your managed services, it's all the things that you're probably including for your clients now, patching, antivirus, password management, user management, and so forth. But then we get into encryption. And the bottom line is, too, maintaining evidence of security and compliance. End users don't understand all those things that are documented here. So not only don't they have the tools or the ability, the knowledge to do it, they don't have any way to maintain the evidence. So whatever your uh, ticketing tool is, if you're using something like ConnectWise or Autotask or TigerPaw or even something that's homegrown, then you've got the ability to create documentation, which if the client's ever audited, you can provide to them to provide to the federal government for an audit. So Here's an example of an, an issue, and this was a HIPAA penalty in upstate New York where the ARC of Erie, ARC is a, um, it's a nonprofit agency, they published patient data to the internet and the New York Attorney General issued a $200,000 fine for doing that. It's amazing how many times we've seen patient or seen penalties for information published to the internet. And you know that when you take a server out of a box, or in today's world, if you're virtualizing one, there are different functions that that server could have. It could be a domain controller. It could be a file server. It could be a uh, print server, a SQL server. But it also could be a web server. And there are switches you can turn on that will publish the information to the web. And it's happened way too many times in HIPAA. So when you look at this slide, this is an argument for you to go to a, a, an end user, a client, or a prospect, 
and say, these are all the services that we offer, and you don't want to be screwing up and doing things like publishing information to the Internet, and that's why you should work with us. Does HIPAA require current computers? Harry said he's wearing his XP shirt today. And that's a pretty old shirt, by the way, since XP lost its patches and updates a long time ago, and that was after it was introduced like 15 years before. <laughs> so under the same rule about protecting health information, the federal government, the OCR, Office for Civil Rights, in June of 2018, so this is very current, issued patching guidance because there were so many issues relating to unpatched systems that they put out a guidance document. Remember, a law was passed that said you had to protect information. Here, this wording of 164.312 is written, is taken right out of the rule. So when you read that, it doesn't say you have to patch. It says you have to protect electronic protected health information. So what does that mean? Well, this is the guidance document that said you, you have to patch. And it says under the security rule, covered entities and business associates, which is, remember I said, like 4 million businesses, are required to protect their electronic protected health information, which includes identifying and mitigating vulnerabilities of computer programs and systems that could affect the security of EPHI. This is a multi-page document. This is just one sentence out of it. But you can see right here that they're clearly telling all of your prospects and clients, and yourself, by the way, that you have to patch systems. So the Anchorage Community Mental Health Services, another nonprofit agency, paid a penalty of like $150,000, and this wording came right out of the penalty itself. So again, if you go out and Google this, you can read the federal document that was signed by Anchorage Community Mental Health Services as a settlement that says that they failed to ensure that information technology resources were both supported and regularly updated with available patches. So this is, again, an argument for you to take to end users. So I wrote an article that was published just this week. And yep. as I understand it, Harry, it helped you go to sleep last night? Yes, sir. It, it, it actually did. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, ho hopefully it won't put all the rest of you to sleep. <laughs> but this article is a healthcare IT publication, so it's not just seen by managed service providers, it's seen by people throughout the healthcare industry, and it talks about the end of Windows 7 and Server 2008 support and why that will become a security and compliance problem. And if you read through the whole article, the end of the article says you don't have the resources to do this yourself. I'm talking to the end users. So you need to work with a professional IT company to have to outsource your replacement project. So this is something where you could take this article, include it with all of your proposals, or even go out to say a Rotary Club and talk about this using the article as the basis and why organizations that have to replace computers. By the way, we're talking about HIPAA today. Don't forget that every other business and every other industry has to also replace Windows 7 and Server 2008 because it won't be secure. And if they're, say, a financial institution, they're going to be in violation of their own compliance regulations. So does HIPAA require encryption? Yes, it does. It requires encryption of data at rest, which means stored on a device. Email encryption and data transmission encryption kind of come out of the same section of the rule which says that electronic protected health information is being transmitted. So it doesn't matter whether it's being transmitted, for example, as an attachment to an email or in the email itself, or if it's a file that's being transmitted across the Internet. Uh, there you'd use a VPN, for example, to encrypt the connection. But date protected health information has to be encrypted. Medical uh, doctors and dentists can't just be sending emails like from their Gmail account to another doctor's Gmail account. Uh, talking about patients or asking for consults, even though we know that happens a lot. So here, so what you've got there are the sections of the law, or the sections of the rule, and then here are some penalties. Cancer care group, which is a 13 doctor practice, it's not a huge healthcare organization, paid a $750,000 settlement, and Jocelyn Samuels, who was Roger Severino's predecessor as the director of the OCR, uh, in the press release, proper encryption of mobile devices and electronic media. Now, the electronic media in this case happen to be backup tapes. So don't just think we're talking about hard drives and computers or servers. Think about backup tapes, portable drives, uh, 
SD cards and cameras, say at a plastic surgeon's office, whatever the electronic media is, it needs to be encrypted. Reduces the likelihood of a breach. MD Anderson this past year paid a $4.3 million penalty and Roger Severino, who's the current OCR director, said that uh, that they failed to implement effective safeguards such as data encrypted encryption. So again, what you've got here is where the rule is and people that have paid the penalties. Cloud services. The cloud services and data centers have to be compliant. This has been a big argument for years. In the original version of HIPAA, it said that any uh, business associate is an organization that accesses protected health information. Data centers and cloud services claimed, well, we don't access it because uh, the clients are putting their data in our cloud or in our data center, but we can't access it. They hold the encryption keys. Uh, they manage the access. We, we're not uh, you know, an authorized user on that server. And then the, the data centers were claiming, well, we can't get into the cage or the rack. Well, first of all, none of that, th that part isn't true. Uh, and I can tell you for sure, if you don't pay your bill, and you leave your servers and stuff in the rack full of medical data, they're going to break in and get it. The omnibus rule in 2013 changed the definition of a business associate. And the term they used and, and what they also explained in their guidance to the omnibus rule said that if you maintain or persistently store data, it, you're a business associate even if the data is encrypted. So a cloud service, and you can pick any cloud service you want, Microsoft, Google, or even uh, Amazon Web Services, or anybody like that. Even if the data is encrypted, but it's in their infrastructure, they have to comply as a business associate, even if the client manages access, and even if the servers are in a locked cage or a rack. Is data really worth more than gold? And here's the proof that it is. So a thumb drive weighs three quarters of an ounce. So the price of gold right now is hovering around $1,280. So if the thumb drive was solid gold, it'd be worth $960. And you can bet that if somebody handed you a solid gold thumb drive, you're going to protect it. And if they know it's solid gold, they're going to protect it. But for some reason, people think that a little thumb drive that you get free at a conference, if you load it up with patient data, is still a free thumb drive. And here's the, here's the proof that they're wrong. A medical practice uh, up in Massachusetts, adult and pediatric dermatology, paid a $150,000 fine when it lost the thumb drive. A health plan called MAPFRE, M-A-P-F-R-E, paid $2.2 million when it lost the thumb drive. So that proves that the data alone was worth between $150,000 and $2 million, even when the thumb drive had it been solid gold, would have only been worth under 1000 so what's the cost of a data breach? In 2018, the Panama Institute did a report for IBM, so it's out there as the IBM cost of a data breach report, calculated, and this has been going on for many years, and the numbers really haven't changed that much over the years, $233 per record was the cost of a breach across all industries blended together, hospitality, retail, healthcare, everything. And then, if it's in healthcare, it was $408 per record because healthcare is regulated and they have more costs when there's a breach. So, if an organization has 10,000 records, that's between two and four million dollars of risk. If it's 100,000, it's 20 to 40 million in risk. So, these are numbers. Again, you can share this cost of the data breach report with an end user and show them this is what it's cost organizations that have had breaches. Just last month, the American Journal of Managed Care printed a report that was a research report that shows that hospitals that had data breaches paid on average 64% more in advertising expenses to overcome the reputational hits. So what's your biggest opportunity? Right now, you've got a huge opportunity over the next year to replace Windows 7 computers and Server 2008s. And in Harry's case, get the Windows XP machine out of his office, too, because that lost its patches and updates back in 2014. But organizations have to have current supported systems with patches and updates and support from the vendors. What I didn't put on here is that if you want to look deeper, you can also look at the applications that they're running on their systems. We just found somebody 
running Office 97 in Microsoft Office 2003 because somebody wrote an old Access database for them and they still needed to run those applications uh, because it wasn't compatible with the newer versions. But even the software needs to be supported with security patches and updates. So this is a monstrous opportunity for you to, to just make a lot of money this year. So at this point, I'm going to end, but I'm going to ask you to do something. If you want to take out your phone, I will send you the article that I just wrote about Windows 7 and Server 2008, which you can put in with all your proposals so that you can show an independent viewpoint that explains to people why they need to do this, and it's not just you trying to drum up business. I'll send you a free copy of my book, how to avoid HIPAA headaches. If you're in the U.S., you'll get a printed and electronic copy outside the U.S. We'll send you an electronic copy. I'll also send you the documents from the federal government, the OCR's cloud guidance, their patching guidance. I wrote an article about the cloud guidance when it came out. We've got a document that we created called HIPAA Tech Tips, and it says things like this is why you need a domain. And then, and this isn't really funny because we came out with it for a reason, I've got a document that shows you how to set up your uh, Microsoft Word and, and all of your applications you do. so that you'll never misspell HIPAA again. And we've seen it spelled with two Ps, and every one of us in this business has some horror story yep. about somebody that, that misspelled it. But I'll tell you very seriously, if you misspell HIPAA and you're trying to convince somebody that you're knowledgeable and, and that, you know, they should trust you, it's a disqualifier from the trust level to send something out and say, we can help you with H-I-P-P-A. Um, <laughs> that'll turn off a lot of people. So anyway, that, that's it. I hope this has been informative yep. and uh, very now to you. Okay, so a couple of things, uh, gang. Um, Mike, uh, a couple slides ago, had talked about communicating via email with your healthcare provider. So Mike, what I did on screen number two over to my side is I went to a recent communication I had with the Virginia Mason Clinic. I mean, just standard stuff. Got to got to get a refill of some of the things that keep me above ground all day, every day. And I copied not so much that information, but I copied it. It's up in chat, everybody, including the presenters over on your go to webinar control panel. Go to chat and you'll see it. It refers me out. Um, I have to go to this uh, My Virginia Mason account, an encrypted email thing, and I'm looking, uh, I, I put it away, but it's a service that they're using for encrypted email. The email, Mike, the email I got was yep. not much yep. more than you see in chat, and it basically said, you, you, you got to go log on to My Virginia Mason um, account to read the secure email. So uh, simple example, pretty self-explanatory, but that's, folks, that's what it looks like. Um, and with that said, uh, we've got one question keyed up from Keith Nelson, my main man, who I bet on football games with. Keith, I'm going to get to you in a minute because, Joel, you've been very patient. And I want you to overlay Mike's conversation with your conversation. And, folks, be sure to use that question feature to ask your questions. I've got one question from Keith at this point. Joel, you got the talking stick. I appreciate that, Harry. Thanks. Um, from a phone.com perspective, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are a hosted PBX service provider. We work with a lot of MSPs. Um, right now, we have over 400 channel partners. And a couple of years ago, uh, our customer service team uh, was getting requests for a BAA. Well, when they don't know what those things are, they end up on my desk. And so we did some work, we figured it out, um, and we went through all of the processes uh, to achieve HIPAA compliance. Um, and actually, I shouldn't say that. Let's say uh, that we are uh, we're not certified because Mike didn't mention this, but there is no certification authority. So we went through all of the rules. Uh, we evaluated all of our systems. Uh, we do things like train all of our employees on the policies and, and procedures. Uh, there are some interesting things that have happened. Um, Mike mentioned earlier uh, covered entities and business associates. Uh, when I get a request for a, a business associate agreement, uh, I ask, are you a covered entity or a business associate? 
I would say about 30% of the time, I either get unknown or the wrong one. And I can fairly well interpret uh, if they are a mental health professional, they're a, a general practitioner's office, they're certainly a covered entity. But there are others by their names that I can't. And we have a large number of billing companies, um, management companies, or even MSPs that work with uh, uh, healthcare clients. This has turned out to be something that's very important for us. Um, we are continuing to uh, work with our MSP partners to help grow this area. And the reason that we wanted to be on this session was to let people know that we are, as a voice over IP service provider, uh, very much working to be as compliant as possible, uh, that we will sign a business associate agreement for both uh, covered entities and uh, for business associates. Uh, and it's something that uh, within uh, my industry, you'll find that some of my competitors will say they're a HIPAA compliant, but they may not be willing to sign a business associate agreement. Uh, they may charge extra for it. I made the decision that we're not. We're going to provide this as a courtesy to our customers, and we want to build market share. Um, that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, we go through the steps and we are very diligent in trying to improve any time we find an area uh, that needs improvement. Let me stop there. Yeah, and, and, and Joel. And, um, Terry, I want to throw something in too. Yeah, yeah. I, go ahead, Mike. I, I've seen businesses in Joel's space of the, of, of the industry that have claimed they're HIPAA compliant and spelled it with two P's. There you go. Hey, Joel, um, pr appreciate the uh, the commentary. Uh, will you be at IT Expo in Fort Lauderdale next week? In fact, I will. And the the amusing part of it is that I actually live 10 minutes from the convention center, but I'm in <laughs> Chicago right now uh, helping take care of my newest uh, granddaughter. So I'm actually going home to be at the conference, but I will be there. Uh, I am actually speaking on uh, Wednesday morning at okay. 9 o'clock. Uh, so I will certainly be there. Uh, if there are any of the folks uh, yep. listening in, um, please, please hit me up. I'd love to meet with you. Yeah, and folks, what I'm going to do in, uh, is I'm going to go ahead and paste. Please look at comments or chat, excuse me. I am pasting the link for IT Expo Inc. Here we hit enter, and there we go, Joel. So they can see both both you and I um, on that site. And uh, Joel, I'm talking about blockchain and data uh, backup. Uh, what what is your topic? Forgive me. Actually, it's the same one we're talking about here. It's uh, okay. talking about uh, the fact that I believe that especially for MSPs. Looking at uh, the healthcare market and its voice applications is something that uh, hasn't really been uh, targeted very well. And I believe that, uh, again, from a phone.com perspective, um, let's just say that there was some skepticism at the executive level. Why should we put out this effort? You know, um, we've already got 30,000 business customers. You know, we're not focused on any specific verticals. And I, to that, I say, ha, you know, let's focus, <laughs> let's put our heads together and let's be able to relate to the, the, the target clientele that we're looking for. And so that's the topic that I'm talking about um, Wednesday at nine o'clock. All righty. I'll, uh, I'll be on site Thursday, Friday, Joel. I'll see you then. Um, Keith Nelson uh, says, Harry, you owe me the dinner because Dallas beats Seattle. Yes, Keith, I know that. <laughs> Um, I'll catch you down in Southern Cal on that. And then, uh, Keith, this is for, uh, I, I'm sorry, Mike, this is for yourself from Keith Nelson. Early on, he's been very patient. And he said, hey, can we back up? Mike said, U.S. law, the question I keep getting is, are the laws applied based on the origin of the data or the delivery point? Um. Well, when you say the origin of the data or the delivery point, I'm not sure exactly what Keith means by that. 
Do, do you? Is there an example or a? Uh, yeah. Well, hold on. Let me see. Keith, are you on mic? I, I, Keith, I can bring you on live. Keith says we deal with international clients. Keith, are you? I'm over on the control panel. I think I can elevate you to talk, or Ginny could do that. Um, he says we deal yes. with it. We, oh, do, you we, are. Deal with, we have um, Go. customers who are international. Um, so they use um, some medical groups that are both in the U.S. and in Europe. And because the executives travel back and forth, and at times um, they ship this health data uh, you know across the pond so yeah. do the hipaa laws apply to the um point the data originates or to the point the data is delivered to okay thanks thanks keith now, now i've got a scenario that i can i can picture um, okay. so, so let me give you so uh, there's a couple different ways to answer this let me start out here in the u.s and how the state attorneys general look at things uh, you're talking about international, I'll get to that. But here in the U.S., HIPAA is a federal law that protects protected health information where it is. So if you go to the Cleveland Clinic and, and you're Harry from uh, the state of Washington, the Cleveland Clinic has to protect your data under HIPAA and it has no bearing on the fact that he's from the state of Washington or any other state in the U.S. It's protected under federal law. However, the Attorney General from Washington or the Attorney General from New York or Massachusetts believes that they are to protect their residence information no matter who has it. So uh, a lady named Mara Healy is the Attorney General of Massachusetts. She has successfully gone after like Rhode Island and uh, New Hampshire medical institutions for having breaches that included the data on her state's residents. And the state attorneys general are not well, they're independent in the sense that, you know, state by state, they elect an attorney general, but they're very cooperative. They, they have an association and they have a lot of reciprocity. So the attorney general from uh, New Hampshire is not going to tell Mara Healy, get out of my turf. They're going to support her efforts to go after an organization. So that's where not just where the information comes from, but it's where the person's a resident of. Now, to answer your question on the international law and uh, when you're saying across the pond, let's ignore the concept of Brexit. We don't know where that's going yet. So let's just assume everybody in the UK and the EU are all governed by GDPR. So when a medical record here in the US, which is protected by HIPAA, moves over to Europe, it assumes the protection of the, uh, of the GDPR. So GDPR and the European regulations technically to, are to protect the information of European residents and things. But that doesn't mean that if you are the uh, biggest medical clinic in, in uh, Italy or Germany or France or something, and you have a breach, that you get to not have to notify or deal with the folks that came into your uh, facility from outside the country. Everybody has to be protected. Uh, the information is protected no matter where it came from. So th this is one where it's, it's kind of the answer. It's both the origin of the information because it's coming from a medical facility here in the U.S. It's going, uh, to use your term, across the pond and it's ending up in a system there. Once it's in that system, it has to be protected uh, the same way that any local resident in that country's information would be protected. And go back to what I said, though, earlier, because I made the comment to Harry. You can put your stuff on Facebook. And this is one of the discussions we end up having with clients, uh, healthcare providers here in the U.S. It's not a fair fight. And what I mean by that is that there have been situations where patients have put out on Facebook and, and review sites and things like that, Dr. So-and-so is a jerk. He treated me horribly. He you know, made me sick, almost made me die, all these horrible things. And then the doctor cannot defend themselves in the public arena by saying, that person's lying, here's what we did. That's actually occurred in a couple places, and the healthcare provider has been penalized for sharing the patient's healthcare information without authorization. So the source of the information, if it's a HIPAA-covered entity or a business associate that has the information, they can't share it. But you as the individual, or if uh, you did authorize like a family member or someone to get your medical information and they shared it, that's fine. There's no law governing that. 
Cool. And uh, I think you've also, Gene uh, McKelvey asked, and I think you've answered this, Mike, in the same uh, presentation here to, to Keith. He asked, uh, document is generated in the U.S. and needs to be sent to Germany. So I think I think we probably checked off on the cross-border transaction activity. Um, Ken Schaefer asked, Ken, uh, don't know if you have access to your phone or mic. If you want to ask the question live, uh, um, let me know, a uh, longtime listener. And um, uh, yeah, okay, Ken says he's better if I ask his question today. Thank you, Ken, out of Portland, Oregon. Um, Ken asks, how are HIPAA laws and regulations applied to governmental health care? Uh, provider licensing organizations such as the Washington Board of Physical Therapists. Um, I can repeat that, Mike, is, is, is a long sentence, uh, or do you feel comfortable with the question? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Well, f first of all, it brings up one other point, and I didn't bring this up in my presentation, which is that completely outside of HIPAA, Privacy and confidentiality is a license requirement for healthcare professionals. It's also a requirement in other industries like accountants and lawyers. But yeah. one of the things, one of the bad things that can happen, and th this is what I told my doctor who told me one day he didn't think the federal government would ever come in and penalize him for HIPAA violation because he was too small of a practice. I said, you know what? If you violated my HIPAA rights, federal government's my third call. My first call is going to your state licensing board that can pull your license and, and kill your career. My second call is going to your, or going to my lawyer who can sue you and take away, don't even worry about your Mercedes, we're gonna take away your wife's Mercedes because that's gonna ruin your life even more than you losing yours. And then my third call is going to the federal government. Now, the question has to do with medical information being shared by other organizations. So in, in the different states, and, and I think uh, the, the description is, is similar to uh, the experience I had, say, in New York State, where I was the chief information officer for a hospital. There were uh, medical conditions and things that were reportable at the state level. We had to report cancer diagnoses. We had to report uh, certain types of illnesses and, and things like sexually transmitted diseases and HIV and some other things that were reportable to the state agencies and the state health department. Those health departments and agencies are also under HIPAA. There's no exemption from the medical information that's going to them. And one of our clients is a cloud platform that is taking all the information from all the hospitals in the United States about their patients when they're applying for accreditation or reaccreditation. So hospitals are accredited by a group called uh, the Joint Commission. And our client has the contract with the Joint Commission to gather all this information for hospital accreditation and they have to comply with HIPAA and so does the Joint Commission. So the medical records that are identifiable and contain information about healthcare are protected everywhere. Now, if you remember, I talked about that lawsuit in Connecticut where the uh, patient sued or doctor it took 12 years and was an $853,000 fine. What happened there was that the um, ex-boyfriend's lawyer subpoenaed the patient's medical records. Under HIPAA, when a medical group gets a subpoena, they're supposed to notify the patient to give them an opportunity to, to fight it. And even if they can't uh, win the battle to not send the information, they can get, can get a court to seal it. So an unauthorized person can't see it. So in this case, neither of those things were done and the ex-boyfriend got the information about the patient. So there are rules even with the courts where the courts can get the information that would be, for example, necessary for a lawsuit. And there are a lot of lawsuits, personal injury cases and things where medical records are critical. Yeah, but the court can seal those so they don't end up in the uh, online docket for everybody to go you know, read about your, your medical condition uh, or your mental health care or your HIV status uh, just because you ended up in a lawsuit with someone. All righty. Uh, a couple more questions, a comment. First of all, Gene says, thank you. Ken says, I'm in Salem, Oregon. And then we have uh, uh, Chris Prince. And I, Chris, I, 
I, I just had to go look at your LinkedIn profile on screen number three, and I see that you've been at NetSys for coming up on 20 years. That means we darn near met when you started that endeavor and you came to the early, early SMB Nation events, and uh, you're located out in the uh, the Midwest in uh, Iowa. So thank you for, for being a friend all these years. She asked, is if a patient wants their uh, protected information put on a USB key, are you required to encrypt the USB key? Is that for me? Yeah, yeah, Mike. Uh, okay, no, not at all. So here, here, here's what's different. Okay. The, the patients, so, so this is where, when, when you look at it and you look at all these rules, and again, you have to look at the guidance and some of the exceptions that were in there. In the omnibus rule, one of the questions had to do with, is it okay to email patient information? And the answer is no, but if the patient wants it emailed to their unsecure email account, like a Gmail account or Hotmail or whatever, then you're supposed to warn them it's not secure. You're supposed to get their approval to do it anyway, and you're supposed to document that. And then if you send them their medical records to their, say, free Gmail account or, or whatever you know free account they have, you're not responsible for the security. Same kind of thing with uh, thumb drives or, uh, I don't know, if people are using CDs anymore, any sort of media that you're giving to patients. One of the issues that uh, the government's really strict on and they focus on a lot is they don't want to create a lot of barriers for people to have to get to their medical information. So they've loosened up the controls when it's giving the information to the patient. Now. If you were a doctor's office and you were sending, not through the patient, not handing it to the patient, but you were sending the patient's information on, say, a thumb drive to another practice, that would have to be encrypted because covered entity to covered entity or covered entity to business associate, you have to encrypt data. But because you use the patient as the example, you don't have to do it because the government could consider that a, um, a an obstacle for them getting their information. Okay, dokie. Hey, uh, folks, the board is clear of questions. Um, while you're maybe marshalling your final questions before we call it a day, uh, again, a little bit of housekeeping. Use the question feature. You can see Joel and I at IT Expo, um, the second half of next week. In Fort Lauderdale, check your chat screen for the link to that. I, it, my recollection is it's a low cost. Uh, and if you know a vendor, I think it's even a no cost conference to go to. So poke around, find yourself there. Um, and here we go. Ken, ta, 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 Ken Schaefer out of Salem is asking, is it recorded? Yes. Uh, Ken, that's actually a really good question. We always record the webinars, but you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste our channel, the SMB Nation channel up on YouTube. Let me put that into comments for everybody. There's the the link, I hope. I'll do that. Well, I'll do that while we're talking. We have some more questions, but folks, subscribe to the SMB Nation YouTube channel. You'll also get a link for the replay from Jennifer Hallmark. Um, Chris Fitton asks, is a dom in, in the domain environment, we have general users, sign, is, sign in is staff. Uh, Chris goes on to say, but they have unique usernames within the EMR application. Is that okay? So domain sign on is generic uh, staff, but then individual usernames inside EMR. Is that okay, Mike? Well, it depends, and here's what it depends on. It depends on what access privileges those uh, users who are not uniquely identified can get to. So, for example, I have never been to a medical office, medical clinic, health plan, uh, business associate, where an average user couldn't get the protected health information somewhere on the network. And, and when I say on the network, outside of the electronic health record system. So when you're signing on, to your local computer and you're signing on as just say staff or nurse or doctor or receptionist in other words not uniquely identified to the individual if you can get to any patient data that's a violation of the law and this again is where we hear the myth well I don't have to worry about security on my local network 
because all of our information is up in the cloud. It's not true. If the healthcare provider sends a bill to an insurance company and it's turned down, they're going to write an appeal letter. If a doctor is sued for malpractice, somebody in the practice, a practice administrator, or if they're a big one, say a general counsel, if maybe they employ their own lawyer, is going to start writing letters and putting documents together and storing them on the server or on a local machine. So the reason I say it depends is that we have had some clients where they've taken computers, for example, in examining rooms where you go to the doctor and, you know, there's five rooms and they put you in the room and, and you wait for the doctor. On those computers, they've been set up in Windows kiosk mode. So you could log in as anybody, but you can't get to anything. There's no access to a server share. There's no access to my documents or anything on the local computer, but there's a link to the electronic health record system. So I'm going to tell you that unless you're running in kiosk mode, where the only thing that you can get to when you log into that local computer is a link to get the electronic health record program, then you're violating the law because if you can get to a file logged in with a generic username, that's violating HIPAA. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have Don uh, Heckenkamp, uh, Dan, excuse me, Dan Heckenkamp. Dan asks, how do we keep up after all the changing HIPAA regulations when we are a small MSP? That's actually a really good question. Do you have a newsletter, Mike, and other, you know, periodic updates and guidance to stay current? Uh, well, Harry, that's one of the reasons we do this kind of thing. I don't okay. publish a newsletter periodically because a lot of times, uh, things will spin up very quickly, and then we get out of cycle on a newsletter. And uh, you know, we'll, we just sent so, so the article that I just wrote about Windows 7 and Windows yep. uh, uh, Server 2008. We just sent out to all of our clients today, and we have a group of uh, MSPs that have referred clients to us, and we sent it out to them as well. But we don't, and, and frankly, we're just pretty busy. We're a small organization. I don't uh, have a great marketing engine, which we're working on right now. To be able to blast this kind of stuff out, but I'll, sure. I'm just going to give you you a plug, Harry. You called me and said, "Can we do a HIPAA update?" And you've got a bunch of folks who took time today, and others that maybe didn't have time today, and to watch the recording. Uh, I would say pay attention to these channels as well, and uh, we will be glad to come on and, and help everybody. I love teaching. I love MSPs. Uh, I've been an MSP. I know what it's like. You know, in the trenches, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. Uh, I've been, I worked for a cloud service. So, I, you know, I know what that's like. But, um, you know, it's a great question. My, my answer to you is that, first of all, there are some, uh, like the federal guidance. Here on the slide it says I'm going to send you the OCR cloud guidance. Now, I'll also tell you some of the government websites are down right now because of a shutdown. <laughs> but most of these, you can, no, well, no, seriously, most of these you can log into. And say, you know, when a new guidance document comes out, send it to me. I want to be on your list, sir. So, you know, those are the kinds of things. If you go to our website, uh, you will see uh, articles and things that I've written that are in our blog. And, uh, for example, I'm going to send you the article if you, if you text Harry to our phone number uh, on the uh, Windows 7 and 2008 stuff. Healthcare IT Today is a website that sends information out literally every day. So, you know, take some time. We don't like our inboxes full, but there are some resources that I look at every day, and yeah. uh, there's some that you should look at to keep up on this stuff. And, Joel, same question over at your firm. Do you blog? I, I, I know you speak periodically to the industry. Um, are you a resource to, to stay current as, as people are able? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we do work with several organizations that keep us advised yep. uh, and candidly that stay on top of me uh, to make sure that we complete our audits and that we update our policies. So yes, absolutely. Cool. Cool. And we'll have your uh, information. Um, let's see, looking back over screen number two, looking at the uh, the questions. Um, I Chris, I think we... Uh, answered your question about the admin rights. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I'm going to move on to Gary. Uh, Jerry. Jerry asked, 
how will Mike send us the information based on the text message? So that, fair enough. How, how do people get the goods? <laughs> so so w w when you send the text message in, you'll get a reply that has a link in it. And when you click on the link, the web link, then you will have a form to fill out so we know how to contact you and to send the stuff and your physical address so we can ship your book. So you text in, you should get a reply that has a link, and then if uh, you fill out the form, then you'll get the materials. All righty, works great, just did it. Dennis Wilson, looking over the user list. I see a, a, a friend of the family over at Skykick, Lauren Wood. Lauren, you can run, but you can't hide. So thank you for joining us from the group over at Skykick, and I'm assuming we'll see you at Ingram Cloud um, in, in about 45 days. You don't have to reply, but I just was perusing who's on the uh, who's who's attending today. Folks, last, last, last opportunity to ask a question, and um, otherwise we're going to call it good. And Mike, uh, we'll get you back. Um, we'll get the Mary. We'll put the band back together for summer quarter at the state level. I was over here in OneNote making a couple of notes about that. So, uh, Harry, can I jump in with the yeah, last yeah, yeah, Joel, yeah, go ahead. Final, yeah, take us out. <laughs> one, one of the things that that happens often um, when I'm talking to MSPs and our other channel partners is occasionally they'll say, "Well, Phone.com is a phone company. I mean, you don't have patients. You don't deal with any of this." Where is anything that you're doing uh, proprietary or PHI or otherwise? And one of the points that I have to make to them is that anything that we have, whether it is a voicemail, you know, someone calls a doctor and says, my whatever is flaring up. We have that yep. information. Yep. It's stored on our servers. Faxes, SMS text, um, and we even offer call recording as one of our features. If they've got that turned on, that information is stored in our servers. Mike used the phrase earlier, data at rest. And we believe that anytime data at rest is in our systems, we have to encrypt them. And we do that. We have access controls. We have audit trails. All of that are, are the requirements that we've had to adhere to. And so even though we're a voice over IP phone company, we understand what our obligations are and we take them very seriously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you, you actually spurred a final thought from myself, uh, unrelated, but um, Mike, going back to the Windows 7 and 08 opportunity. So you and I talked about that, um, what, seven days ago, 10 days ago, and thank you for sending the article. And I met with, uh, on Friday, out in Bellevue, Washington, in one of the Microsoft buildings, I met with the uh, Modern Workplace team um, that has a motion that oversees the involvement of M365, which would include the Windows operating system. And we talked a little bit about developing the messaging. Um, you had a, I believe your graphic mic was a, a, a time bomb, which is fair. And, and I said, guys, you know, my, my uh, free advice today um, to be continued, but the, uh, what we did with XP, and I've got my XP shirt on, where is it? There we go, back in the XP migration era, was we tried the scare tactics, the home alarm sales tactics, the bad guys out there in the bushes. And um, we, we didn't land it as an industry, not, not just Microsoft, not just the team I was on inside OEM. We, we didn't land it. And I said, you know, let's, let's, let's go back, let's throw that out and let's go back to the, uh, the whiteboard and come up with some new messaging. Now, that's a work in progress. But um, Mike, I don't know, you know, you, you, you had, a, quite frankly, a better dimension on it in terms of compliance. Um, not so much bad guys out in the bushes trying to break in. <laughs> All right. So, so, so Harry, the, the, let me just take one more minute though, because I, yeah, I want yeah, to do yeah. a little counter. I, I want to do a little counterpoint to what you said. First of all, we're in a different environment than we were with XP, and the reason for it is we have seen 
a lot of things happened since 2014. Some of them have been HIPAA enforcements against organizations that did not maintain current systems, supported systems. We didn't have yeah. that in, in uh, 2014. We were kind of guessing. And when these penalties came out, uh, frankly, I was vindicated on some articles that I wrote that people argued with when I said that uh, continuing to use things like XP would be compliance violations. But he here's what's really going on, and I think this is a way to look at it, that everybody in today's world, and if you read my article, I reference people like MIT, where in their top 10, uh, the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in their top 10 computing, uh, safe computing tips, number one is patch, patch, and then they put the word patch in all capital letters with exclamation points after it. So we know what the risks are. We know that if you don't have supported systems or you don't patch systems that are supported, that you're creating increased risks. And now you have to look at something like Equifax. So Equifax had the patch from Apache for two months, never installed it, and reached 142 million records. Well, here's the issue, Harry, and this is not just regulatory compliance to government, that there are lawsuits that were being filed within hours of the Equifax breach being announced and it's going to be either a huge settlement or if it ever gets to trial, imagine being on the stand. Imagine you, Harry, being on the stand or, and you're an MSP and somebody says to you, you know, did you tell all your clients to replace the stuff? Well, we showed them what all the benefits and the features were of Windows 10. Well, did you show them what the risks were of Windows 7, continuing to use Windows 7? No, because that would have scared them. And now the question comes in, can you give me any reasons to have continued to use Windows 7 after it's lost its security patches and updates, considering that's what the reason was for the data breach that hurt all of our clients. Now, don't imagine your answer sitting on the stand. Imagine the 12 jurors who are people that go to your church, drink at your bar, get on the ferry with you when you're going to the mainland, whatever. Imagine what those 12 people are going to think of your answer when you didn't warn somebody what the risks were. And uh, I'm of an age, Joel's of an age, you're of an age. When our doctor tells us to do something, you kind of nod your head and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. When your doctor says, Harry or Mike or Joel, you know, you're in your 50s, 60s, whatever the age is. And if you don't have this test, then, you know, you're not going to see your next grandchild. That's going to scare us enough to do it. And I hate to say it, my belief on this is that when there's that much risk involved, kind of have to scare people. The doctor shouldn't say lose 20 pounds because, you know, it's good for you. It's like lose 20 pounds because you're borderline diabetes and yeah. that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. Just, just my yeah. point. Thank you. Well, let's, let's end on that positive note. We're at time. <laughs> it's giving you a hard time, Mike. Hey, we have a couple of thank yous lining up. We're going to end with a couple of thank yous. We had Dennis Wilson asking, when are we going to be in San Diego? Hey, Dennis. Um, I will be in San Diego in mid-March with the Ingram Cloud Conference, so let's uh, let's tap each other and have a little fun down there. Dave says, thank you, MSP Tech Talk, Mike and Joel, good presentation. And Ken says, uh, working on a question, um, hurry, Ken. And then Tom Warner says, thanks for the informative webinar. So, uh, uh, Ken, okay, you slipped it in, Ken. Ken... We're, we're going to overtime by about a minute. Ken Schaefer, Salem, Oregon, says, sadly, there have been some patches released that have actually caused problems, and so many of us have not deployed them um, and have or have removed them. Is this uh, issue going to affect potential liability, compliance, and enforcement issues? That's a fair question. So you get a, you, you get a bad patch on an OS, and you um, aren't going to upgrade to the new OS or you remove the OS, uh, what's your exposure, um, Mike? It's a pretty good question. Well, it, you know, it's a great question because we, we've just seen this recently with a couple of Microsoft patches that have uh, caused a lot of problems. And, and in the old days, Harry, you know, you're sitting in front of a blue screen. We knew that almost every patch was going to bring a blue screen and <laughs> that, that we had to wait on it. But in today's world, first of all, there, there's no set answer. But I think that there's a reasonableness to this. You know, if, if you're up to the, like, second most recent patch and you're waiting to apply the new one, 
because you want to make sure that you know the headlines tomorrow aren't that this patch has blown up you know half the systems in the world. That's reasonable. But we just had a client that was 19 security patches behind on one of their servers. That isn't going to cut it. So I, I think that it's reasonable to uh, schedule patches. First of all, as an MSP with all your clients, in the old days, patches just hit. And yeah. you knew the patch Tuesday was going to bring hell on Wednesday. But in today's world, you can throttle them so that not every client's patched and updated at the same time. But I think that the answer is you want to stay very close and have a pretty strong argument, which, which is legitimate, that you know we don't install a patch the day it comes out. But you also, I would say, shouldn't wait, you know, 45 to 60 days. So there's no 30-day rule or seven-day rule, but uh, stay as close to current as you can while being diligent not to break your client systems. All righty. Well, I'll tell you what. I got to, folks. I got to bring it. I got to bring it uh, to a close. So Jenny over in the radio control room. Thanks as always, Joel. Thank you, sir, from Chicago. We'll see you next week, Mike. God knows where I'll see you. I'll see you soon. I know I'll see you at the CompTIA event in typically late July, early August. Um, so <clears throat> looking forward to it. Thanks, uh, Gene, Ken, all the Tom, all the others on the question board. Jenny, go ahead and take us out. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joel. Thank you both.